Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. In this video, what we're going to talk about is uh, the drug chloramphenicol, uh, the old name for which is chlor chlo um, chlamytromycin, chloramphenicol. Okay, and this is an uh, example of a bacteriostatic antibiotic, uh, i.e. Um, it doesn't kill bacteria, so a, a, bacteria, a bactericidal antibiotic is one which actually kills bacteria. Instead, a bacterial, uh, bacteriostatic antibiotic uh, is one which um, stops the bacteria from dividing, basically. So it doesn't kill the bacteria that are already existing, uh, but it does uh, stop the bacterial colony from dividing anymore, from getting any bigger. And then what it relies upon is the, uh, the um, person who has the infection having a healthy immune system, which can then kill uh, the bacteria now that they're not dividing, basically. So it controls the infection, it stops it from getting any bigger, but then it relies on the immune system to take out what's already there, basically. Okay, so this is an example of a bacteriostatic antibiotic. So it stops the bacteria from dividing, but doesn't actually kill the ones that you already have. Okay, so uh, we're going to see the mechanism by which chloramphenicol works. And basically, it's a protein synthesis inhibitor. It's going to stop the production of proteins. And the way it stops production of proteins is by interacting uh, with the ribosome and preventing translation of mRNA. So the bacterial cell still produces its mRNA. So let's draw the bacterial cell here. So remember, the stages of protein synthesis are that you start off with the DNA in the nucleus here. So let's say this is the DNA here. Okay. Then what you have to do is you have to make a piece of mRNA here. And then that mRNA is then uh, translated by a ribosome into a uh, protein, basically. So the mRNA goes through and you create a uh, polypeptide here. So that's the uh, process of trans, uh, well, the process of um, protein synthesis. And basically, chloramphenicol is going to stop this process here. It's going to stop translation. It doesn't stop transcription. Transcription is still going to occur fine within our bacterial cell exposed to chloramphenicol or chlamytromycin. Um, but it will stop the translation of that mRNA into the polypeptide. Okay, so uh, to understand how it's going to block uh, the translation, we need to have a solid understanding of how translation actually works. So before we can discuss how uh, chloramphenicol works, let's discuss how translation works. Okay, so we begin then with our mRNA strands. So let's say this is our mRNA strand here. Okay, so um, we'll draw it as a little sort of rectangle here. So let's say this is our piece of mRNA. Now remember, mRNA is a, a single-stranded nucleic acid, so loads of organic bases polymerized together, basically. Uh, and uh, they are uh, ribose nucleotides, i.e. the uh, sugar uh, that forms the sugar phosphate backbone is ribose rather than deoxyribose. Okay, and of course you have the organic base uracil rather than thymine. Now, basically for uh, translation to begin, what needs to happen is this mRNA strand needs to assemble with the ribosome. And what happens is the ribosome in bacteria is constructed out of two portions. So the ribosome is made out of two portions, a 30S portion, which I'll show here, so a 30S portion, and also a bigger 50S portion. Now, first, you, um, you first assemble the mRNA with the 30S subunit first. Okay, so let's begin this process then. So the first step in translation is that the 30S subunit needs to... Um, needs to bind to our mRNA. Now, in order for it to bind to mRNA, there needs to be a certain initiation factor present, namely initiation factor 3. Now, really, what happens is this 30S ribosomal subunit actually associates with all of the initiation factors initially. So it's going to associate with three initiation factors. One, two, and three, basically, here. Okay, so this is one, let's say, here. This is two, this, and this is three, here. 
and then it also binds a molecule of GTP. So this gets the 30S ribosomal subunit ready. So the 30S ribosomal subunit uh, binds with these initiation factors. So I've labeled them um, initiation factor 1 through 3. So this here is an initiation factor. And in this case, this is specifically initiation factor 3. Now, people don't generally want to write out continuously initiation factor 3. So instead, initiation factor 3 is often denoted IF3. Okay, right. So the first step is that the 30S ribosomal subunit needs to get ready to uh, form the bond with the mRNA. Now, the only initiation factor that is actually utterly necessary in order for the 30S subunit to be able to bind the mRNA is this initiation factor 3 here. But all of them will be bound there, really. Okay, so uh, now what happens is that the mRNA is going to bind with this 30S ribosomal subunit with all its initiation factors. And the mRNA has a specific portion here which um, binds, to the, um, binds to the 30S ribosomal subunit. And this portion of the mRNA, which is uh, specific, has a specific sequence of amino acids specialized to bind with the uh, 30S ribosomal subunit. This has a very special name. It's called the Shine Dalgano sequence. So this is the Shine Dalgano sequence. Okay, so the Shine Dalgano sequence usually has within it uh, the sequence of organic bases A, G, G, A, AGA. So usually this sequence here, which is usually around six uh, organic bases long, uh, will somewhere in that uh, sequence of six organic bases have this agar. And basically, this shine dalgano sequence is the portion that actually binds to the um, binds to the 30S ribosomal subunit. So let's show our mRNA bound here, and this is the shine dalgano sequence bound up here. Let's say, okay, now. The shine dalgano sequence is usually just about um, 5 to 10 organic bases upstream of the start codon. So down here, what you will have is the start codon. And this is where you will actually begin translation, basically. So all of this stuff upstream isn't actually going to be translated. This bit here, the shine dalgano sequence, was there in order for the mRNA to bind to the 30S ribosomal subunit. And here's where you're actually going to start translating from. So this is the start codon. Okay, and the start codon usually has a specific, well, it is, it always has a specific uh, organic base sequence, basically. It's the sequence AUG, which I always think is quite helpful because I always think of augment, which means make bigger. So that's quite how a, a handy way of remembering that this is the start codon, the start of translation, the start of making something. Okay, uh, so... Um, the shine dalgano sequence is usually around uh, 5 to 10 organic bases upstream of the uh, start codon. So usually this gap in between the shine dalgano and the start uh, codon is usually around 5 to 10 organic bases, basically. Okay, so now what's going to happen, now that we have bound our mRNA uh, to our ribosome like so, then the next step is for the first tRNA to come and bind to this start codon. Okay, so um, the first tRNA is going to need to have an anticodon, which is complementary to the codon of this start codon. So the start codon has the organic bases A followed by U followed by uh, G, basically. So this is what I've just drawn as a pink sort of block before. So this pink rectangle um, represents this, uh, these free organic bases like so. So this is the start codon. Basically, the first tRNA is going to need to be complementary to this. This is called the codon, the, the, um, um, the um, certain combination of free organic bases on the mRNA. And the complementary uh, sequence of free organic bases on the tRNA is called the anticodon. So in this case, uh, the first uh, organic base on the anticodon is going to be U, which is complementary to A. So remember, the tRNA is RNA as well, so it doesn't have thymine in, so it has uracil, uracil instead. 
Okay, then the complementary organic base DU is another adenine. And then guanine, the complementary base, is cytosine. So that's the uh, complementary anticodon on the tRNA. Okay, and then for the purposes of a cartoon, we'll just show the tRNA as this sort of L shape, upside down. And then we'll show uh, the um, amino acid that's mounted on the tRNA just as a blob at the end here. So this is the tRNA, or standing for transfer RNA, and here's the amino acid that's mounted on the tRNA. Amino acid. Right. Now, um, amino, uh, well, tRNAs, uh, you will have many different tRNAs. You have one for every possible... Well, uh, no, you don't, actually. You have one for most codons. All but the stop codons have tRNAs, which binds to them, basically. So there are three stop codons. There are 64 possible combinations that you can have as codons, and therefore there are 64 possible combinations as anticodons. Three of the anticodons do not exist, because those are the stop codons. And the whole idea is that you don't have a tRNA, which then binds to them, and that's what causes the termination of the uh, translation. The other 61 do all exist, so those tRNAs do exist for every possible one of those 61 codons, okay? And each one, each tRNA with its anticodon, basically um, will have a specific amino acid that's always attached to it. So this tRNA with this UAC anticodon can't just have any old amino acid attached here. It's always got a certain amino acid attached there. And the amino acid that this specific codon has is formyl methionine. Um, okay, so attached here, in this case, for this specific anticodon, is going to be formyl methionine. So let me just show you the structure of formyl methionine. Okay, so we'll start with the structure of methionine, which is a amino acid, and then we'll uh, discuss what formyl methionine is. So, methionine then, uh, here's the uh, amino group of the amino acid, here's the alpha carbon, and here's the carboxyl group down here. Okay, and here's the hydrogen off the alpha carbon. Now, to turn this into a methionine, what you need to do is put two methylene groups, like so, and then, what you have linked off this methylene group here is a sulfur with a methyl group, like so, linked off it. Okay, and that there is the R group of methionine, and this whole structure is methionine. So this is methionine. Okay, now, uh, the uh, amino acid methionine is linked to the tRNA by, via its carboxyl group. So this is involved in this link here, basically. So I might just highlight that fact. So this link between the tRNA and the amino acid, that involves a bond between um, the tRNA and this carboxyl group of the methionine. Now, that means that the amino terminus is free. It's not involved in this bond with the tRNA. So you can add things onto that amino group, and uh, indeed that's what you do. You add a formal group onto the amino group. Now, formic acid, or methanoic acid, is basically a one-carbon carboxylic acid. So this is the structure of formic acid. It is what would now be called by chemists methanoic acid. Formic acid is the old name for it, uh, and it's still very pervasive among biochemists. Uh, but chemists would now call this methanoic acid. Okay, so formic acid or methanoic acid, we're going to basically uh, bind this to the amino group of the methionine, and we're going to form an amide link, basically. So let me show you what's going to happen. So uh, formal methionine is going to be exactly the same, except to this amino group up here. You've now formed an amide link between that and this formic acid group here. So you've got a carboxyl group there, and then the hydrogen like so. So that is an amide link between this formic acid and this amine group of the methionine amino acid. Uh, so uh, what's happened is you've taken off this hydroxyl group, taken off from the hydrogens off the amino group, formed water out of that, and then bonded this carbon to the nitrogen. Okay, so here's the alpha carbon of methionine, and everything else is exactly the same after that. So here's the R group of methionine, still exactly the same, like so. Uh, sulfur, and then the methyl group, like so. 
Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so the carboxyl group finally just there, uh, which is involved in this link between uh, the amino acid and the tRNA. Okay, so, um, basically, um, this tRNA does not, uh, with this anticodon that's complementary to the start codon, AUG, doesn't have ordinary methionine linked to it here. Instead, it has formal methionine linked to there. So, um, often formal methionine is abbreviated to F-met. So, if you see F-met, that's what it means, formal methionine. And people, therefore, call this entire thing the formal methionine, or F-met, tRNA, basically. Okay. So, what's going to go happen is that uh, this F-met tRNA is going to come and bind to our uh, codon, to our start codon here, basically. So, if I uh, draw that happening, uh, let's say at stage 2 down here, is that uh, this uh, formal methionine uh, tRNA is going to come and bind to our uh, um, start codon. And when it binds, what happens is the initiation factor 3 finally cleaves off from the 30S ribosomal subunit. So this initiation factor has gone now, so I won't draw that one anymore. So the other two initiation factors, along with the GTP, are still present, but that uh, third one has gone. So initiation factor 3 has gone, but initiation factor 1, 2, and this GTP are still there. Now here is the mRNA here. Uh, with the shine dalgano sequence bound to this 30S um, ribosomal subunit here. So this is the shine dalgano sequence. Let me colour it in orange. So that's the shine dalgano sequence. Then you've got this star codon around um, 5 to 10 uh, organic base pairs downstream of the shine dalgano sequence, which is here. So this is this um, start codon here, AUG. Okay, and now what's going to happen, what, well, what has happened, is that this uh, formal methionine tRNA has come in and uh, bound there, basically. So, this whole structure now, with this um, 30S ribosomal subunit, along with the initiation factor 1, initiation factor 2, GTP, the mRNA, and this formal methionine tRNA, that is known as a 30S initiation complex. Okay, and I think we'll call it there for this first video, and we'll continue our discussion of translation heading towards the mechanism of chloramphenicol slash chlamytromycin uh, in the next video.